Good afternoon, everyone, and um, good morning to those in Asia who are actually um, online today. Welcome to uh, Coffee Time at the Jamaica International Arbitration Center. I'm delighted to chair the first webinar in this series entitled COVID-19 and its dispute pandemic implication. The Jamaica International Arbitration Center is focusing in dispute management rather than dispute resolution and coffee time has been implemented to support this focus. Under the leadership of Dr. Malcolm, the center will hold a series of webinars under the umbrella of dispute management in the world. Today's topic, COVID-19 and its dispute uh, pandemic implication. And I am delighted to chair to the first webinar in this series. A few words about myself. My name is Rose Ramo, and I am the founding partner of Ramo International Law, a boutique law firm with the focus of public international law in DC. I'm licensed to practice in US, France, and in Ghana as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court. I am also an international arbitrator, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in UK, and I'm listed on the rosters of institutions in Africa, France, and in the Caribbean. I'm an ICC court member on behalf of Haiti, and I was recently uh, appointed at the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague. Now, before I introduce Mr. Sean Enriquez for his welcome, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about him. Um, Mr. Enriquez is a commercial lawyer and alternative dispute resolution professional with particular ADR focus in the areas of negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and he has been admitted attorney at law in Jamaica and in New York, and as a solicitor in England and Wales, and in the courts of the Dubai International Financial Center. Mr. Enriquez is a Supreme Court of Jamaica's roster mediator, and he's also a panel mediator for several institutional institutions. For a more expensive um, bio of Mr. Enriquez, I would uh, advise that uh, we turn to the Kofi Coffee time, J A I A C dot com. Now, with, um, I should not wait any longer. I'd like to invite Mr. Enriquez to give his uh, formal welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Um, good afternoon here, anyway, everybody. I am here to provide you with a warm welcome to the Jamaica Arbitration, International Arbitration Institute's new series um, entitled Dispute Management in a New World, as Rose has already indicated, with today's topic being COVID-19 and its pandemic implications. Um, basically, uh, the question really is, what are the implications for dispute resolution resulting from the pandemic? Um, obviously, we in Jamaica, as elsewhere in the world, have felt um, extreme uh, consequences approximately six months into the pandemic with the virus charging ahead nonetheless instead of being contained and with no consensus on when the crisis may end decisions uh, regarding the best practices and the future must still be made even with the extreme uncertainty that we're facing all over the place hopefully um, we and all the others around the world will be able to find a solution soon. Um, we in Jamaica hope to be able to not just be here on online using Zoom to, to meet with colleagues and friends like yourself, but to have you here in person one day um, to come and participate in webinars and conferences like this put on by um, the JIC. Um, and Hopefully we can celebrate here. So a short, sweet, warm welcome to Jamaica and the GAIC's um, uh, webinar today. And uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Rose. Um, thank you. 
Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful welcome uh, um, that you gave us. Normally I would speak much, but this program is so rich and so wonderful. I'm so excited. I cannot wait. And I will um, quickly move to introduce Ms. Uh, Therese Turner-Jones with her remarks. Therese, you have the floor. Thank you, Rose, <clears throat> and thank you, everyone, and good afternoon, good morning, um, late afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm also in Jamaica. Um, I've been stuck in my house. This is now my 23rd week of working from home, and I'm sure the rest of you are in similar situations. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the Jamaica um, International Administrative um, Disputes uh, Committee um, for putting on this um, webinar today and also for launching this, this series. I think it's really important given um, where we are in the world and what, what we're experiencing uh, personally, professionally, um, specifically in Jamaica, but globally and every other possible way. Um, this is my first uh, foray into this field. Um, not having not having a legal background apart from my father who was a lawyer and my brother who was a judge in the Bahamas. Um, but I want to say, of course, conflict is everywhere around us, not just in our in our professional lives and in our in commercial life, but also of course in our personal lives. And we're seeing that alive and well in, in COVID. Um, and uh, you know, in the words of Bob Marley, everywhere is war right now. And I think this pandemic has brought home um, and amplified not only inequalities across across the world, inequalities within societies, inequalities within our region, um, and inequalities everywhere. And I think conflict um, is rife in in this kind of uh, global situation. Um, and I'm sure that's why you, you're here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about first, you know, what are some of the challenges posed by COVID-19 for the region and as, and as the manager of uh, six Caribbean countries, including the Eastern Caribbean um, countries, which are managed by the Caribbean Development Bank because they're not members of the IDB. Um, and the six I manage are the five English speaking countries, um, from the Bahamas all the way down to Suriname and including Suriname, which is a Dutch speaking country. So just want to make sure that that's clear. The Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and, and Suriname are the six countries I'm responsible for. And we have some, some projects in the Eastern Caribbean countries. So that's just to clarify that. Obviously the IDB covers all of Latin America and the Caribbean, but the ones that I'm responsible for more intimately um, are those. Um, what we're seeing as a result of this uh, COVID-19, of course, is the absolute um, whammy of an economic crisis along with a health crisis. So that's the first two things and I'm sure all of you in your, in your various uh, spheres are experiencing that as well. Um, I think what is more shocking about the Caribbean because of the high dependency of the majority of countries in this region on tourism, uh, we're seeing an absolute sudden stop of tourism, that whole industry, as it is globally, completely in, in peril. Um, you know, the World Tourism uh, Organization is saying that, you know, tourism has collapsed by at least 85% uh, globally. Um, but in this region, we're seeing um, it play out in terms of many thousands of people across the region are unemployed, and only few of them have return to work as a result of the, I would call a soft reopening of, of our borders um, since the middle of July. And of course, with the reopening of the borders has come more complications uh, with respect to the number of cases and the contagion of COVID-19 that is still uh, running rampant um, in the region and globally, as you know. So having said that, um, I imagine that there, are, there is conflict to, 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 do, to deal with you know, owners of businesses who have employees who've been laid off. Um, there's obviously conflict between the government and the private sector in terms of trying to get support for, for failing industries. And this is a very, very complicated time. Resources are not uh, infinite, as you know, 
and lots of countries in the Caribbean have already been experiencing fiscal uh, distress for many years, and including Jamaica, although Jamaica looks um, fairly healthy relative to some other countries, given that over the last seven years, Jamaica has been doing a really good job at bringing its macroeconomic uh, situation under control. Jamaica still has a high debt to GDP ratio. Uh, it's under 100%, but with this crisis, it's likely to go up above 100% uh, before this is over. Estimates from the fund and IMF and also from us and the research work that we do suggest that the economies of this region will experience anywhere from a 5% to a 12% fall off in GDP in 2020. Um, these estimates were done early in March when we started to look at what the potential impact of COVID would be. Um, and it could, it could be that those numbers are, will be worse because uh, I think um, at the beginning we were looking at a three month scenario, a six month scenario and a scenario that would be longer. And obviously no one, no one on this call, no one in the world today can say exactly when this pandemic is going to end. And certainly the positive scenarios only envisage a vaccine being made available to most people uh, on earth to be able to contain it and also to get back to any kind of normalcy. But I think what we're seeing, of course, is as you've called your seminar, um, this is a new world. And this new world would involve um, new ways of working. Um, on the positive side, from where I sit, I see lots of opportunities coming out of this crisis. And it's not just because by nature, I'm an optimist, which by the way, I am. But I think in every crisis, there's always, um, there are always uh, ways to, to find spaces, I call the liminal spaces, where we can see and find potential areas for growth. And in that, I think the region is, is being given an opportunity to look at, is tourism, the way it's designed and the way it functions in the Caribbean, is that the best business model we have? That's one idea. The other idea is, um, is this not the moment to rethink the way uh, the Caribbean um, produces energy? Uh, because energy, of course, has come up as one of the very important aspects of being able to function during this crisis because we need energy for online learning. And we know that there were disparities across countries and across parts of countries because some kids were able to do online learning whereas others weren't because they didn't have connectivity and so on. So energy looms uh, as, a, as, an op, as, a, uh, as an area for um, growth because there is the prospect of delivering energy differently in the future. So thinking about renewable energy, thinking about solar, thinking about wind, thinking about thermal energy um, uh, is, a, is a potential path of recovery that involves what we call moving along a green trajectory as opposed to the current uh, dependency on fossil fuels. Um, so I think um, with the green recovery and with more investments in health, um, which of course, in the context of managing this crisis, what has been unveiled is that a lot of the infrastructure around health in the region, um, and not just in the Caribbean, but also other parts of Latin America and around the world, there are lots of inadequacies. The infrastructure is not quite there. Healthcare is expensive. It's not available to everybody, and that could be another avenue for growth. Um, but how, however, one, one of the um, areas that we've spent a lot of time developing in the Caribbean over the last five years has been a move to putting a lot of what we do on a digital platform. So the whole piece of digital transformation, how do we orchestrate that in a way that if, for example, in Jamaica, every Jamaican had a national ID that was digital, could it be that we could deliver services um, more efficiently, um, more quickly, and at a much lower cost, particularly in, a, in the context of a pandemic? So these are some of the areas that I think uh, show up as opportunities for changing the way we work. Um, in the Caribbean, um, economists have often, myself included, pointed to the fact that the region is, is really weighed down by inefficient ways of doing not just business but ways of manufacturing we haven't really moved up the curve in terms of techno technological adaptation and so here again is another opportunity to move away from the old ways of doing things and 
and, and leapfrog very quickly into new ways of doing things using more technology. Um, I want to put those up, put that out there as you know, two real positives in terms of how we can look at the recovery and what are some of the areas that, that could drive that recovery. And finally, of course, this is a region that in addition to the health pandemic, um, we're right in the middle of a hurricane season. And so coming off of uh, the 2019, a very um, uh, awful hurricane season in the Caribbean where Hurricane Dorian category five devastated parts of the Bahamas and, um, in particular, that is something that, of course, as we try to work our way out of this pandemic, countries are also trying to struggle with how to prepare themselves in the event that there's a natural disaster. We know that from uh, the, the scientific modeling that um, this year is supposed to be even more active than 2019. So I think um, these are all issues that are on our radar for, for work. Um, I could go into specifics about what we're doing in each country, but I don't think I want to do that. I'd rather take questions from you later on. Um, but what I want to say is, um, I think this is this global pandemic to me presents a real opportunity for the entire world to rethink not just how we do business, but how we relate to each other, the partnerships we form, um, how we relate to our employees, because uh, that could be part of that's the piece of um, arbitration that I'm mo mostly familiar with, having to deal with employee disputes at, at work. Um, but I think uh, we have uh, many, many opportunities to, to really do things better, um, to take a line from the Democratic National Convention, build back better. Um, it's very interesting that they use that line, but I find it um, compelling given that we're in the middle of a hurricane season, I think it's really appropriate. Um, and I just want to say thank you for uh, having me here uh, with you on, on this panel and um, I wish you every success. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Therese. I, I have to say that um, indeed, um, you've given us a lot to think about. And um, I think you were, you've been very humble in your, in, in your introduction. And now I'd like to say a few words about you because um, many on, on this call probably don't know that you have over 25 years experience in the field of macroeconomics and economic development. And I think that says about your, your competence and your role in the Caribbean as well. You have been the Inter-American Development Bank's representative for Jamaica since 2013 and your portfolio expanded in 2017 when you've been promoted general manager of the IDB countries uh, department Caribbean group. So it's, 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 it's a, a privilege to have you come and give us the reality check and also in, in give us some hope because indeed we need to think of a new ways to do things, a new business. So um, thank you so much for this wonderful remark. Now I'd like to turn over to um, Ms. Sharon Flax Brutus, and um, and I'll quickly introduce Ms. Brutus, who is a, a tourism experience creator with over 30 years experience in the industry. At the present, she is the director of operations for Virgin Gorda, Villa Rentals, and Leverick Way Resort in Marina as well as the owner of the destination management company, White Orlando Destinations. Ms. Uh, Flax Brutus is a former director of tourism for the British Virgin Island. Her other tourism industry experience includes having served in senior management position at Rosewood Little Dicks Bay Resort and as a travel advisor in Las Vegas. Um, should you want to know a little bit more about Ms. Um, Mrs. Flax Brutus, I would encourage that you go on our website so you can read a little bit more about her. Now, Ms. Brutus, uh, Flax Brutus, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Rose. Wonderful. Yes, um, I won't say good afternoon, although it's afternoon in my, uh, in my part of the world. I'll just say greetings. And uh, it's my, um, my humble pleasure today to welcome you to uh, everyone to the reasoning uh, dispute management in a changing world led by international thought leaders, Francis Xavier, Lucy Reed, and Robert Vaughn, 
people's individual and collective experiences are what we call capacity deep and jurisdictionally broad. And uh, this reasoning this afternoon will reflect on how they consider and how we look at the ambit of domestic and international COVID-19 caused disputes, possible approaches to resolving them, and of course, sustainable dispute management measures that could be adopted going forward. And uh, this, of course, is the first in a series of webinars that will address our changing world. And I really take this opportunity on behalf of the other sponsoring partners and patrons to thank um, Dr. Malcolm and the Jamaica International Arbitration Center for making this initiative possible. A forum such as this at this juncture in what we are calling the new normal is quite relevant. The rules are changing and so are the mindsets as well as the laws that govern business practices and conflict resolution. Um, as stated before, I operate in the tourism space and have seen in the last few months, uh, many disputes arising from cases of contract suspensions due to force majeure, disputes with unreturned deposits, uh, airlines and hotels filing for bankruptcy and leaving travelers unable to be refunded and as well leaving employees in a quandary, uh, especially here in the, in the, in the, in the Caribbean space, um, many uh, governments don't have um, situations where um, there is unemployment insurance, um, social security payments, and that has left a lot of companies um, reeling. Um, there are even cases that now trump the rule of law in the workplace and are now leading to even more conflict. And of course, hence the need for conflict resolution and what we're calling conflict management. Uh, during this crisis related to COVID and well beyond, loss and damage that is being sustained by companies, whether locally or internationally, small, medium, mom and pop operators, and what I tend to call the common man. Supply chains, including for commodities, financial services, and tourism, are being impacted to a great degree and are contributing to massive losses, not only just for the companies, but for the countries that they operate in. Governments will now need to look at legislative changes and possible intervention. Is that the, is that the way to go? We would appreciate even more vividly than we have before that no one or no organization can remain untouched and that no industry, whether it be financial services, tourism, manufacturing, information technology, none of us can exist uh, on our own. Against this backdrop, we have all recognized, and if we haven't, we soon will, that the significant worldwide economic turndown implications of COVID will result in among other things, as a friend calls it, a dispute resolution pandemic. I'm certain though that this afternoon, our forum will be one of education as well as pondering and reasoning. I like that word reasoning that will help us to navigate the new normal. It will challenge us to explore the boundaries of law as well as the business environment. I thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be on this forum. Thank you very much for this uh, great remark. And indeed, uh, force majeure has been the most call that I've gotten so far in my practice. For a moment, I thought, maybe I should have an area of practice just entitled force majeure. And, <laughs> and um, we are seeing a lot of cases, people who want to get out of the contract due to this um, pandemic. Now, uh, before I turn to um, our Secretary General, Dr. Um, Christopher Malcolm, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few um, um, sponsors who um, have really supported us. Um, the Jamaica Standard Products, Island Blue Jamaica Mountain Coffee, Virgin Gorda Villa Rentals, Luxury Holiday Villas, Breweries and uh, Wallace, Caribbean Producers Jamaica Limited, Charles O'Connor Consulting Network Limited, Virtus Technology, Trial Media Litigation Support Services, Native Answer, Money Musk Rum, and Media Partner, Hype TV. 
So um, I do not see Dr. Malcolm. However, I am going to ask him if he would, uh, uh, there we go. I love seeing your face, Chris. So please don't go away. You are the men of the show. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. I'm so proud to be part of it. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to you so you can take over and introduce our excellent panelists um, for this wonderful webinar. Thank you very much, Rose, for, for the kind introduction. Now, I have been introduced as the Secretary General for the Jamaica International Arbitration Center, and that is what I am for this afternoon running into the evening. More importantly, I think persons are here to, to be part of this reasoning, which will involve three preeminent thought leaders who have a wealth of experience, both at domestic and cross-border levels. And it is in the context really of a pandemic, which for us, it all started out for most of us seeing it as a health, health healthcare pandemic. But those of us who have been observing and certainly the lawyers and persons in the dispute management, the lawyers, mediators, arbitrators, whatever, we soon realized that this was going to have much broader implications in the area of dispute management. Because it is true that while people initially will be thinking about their health and well-being, there comes a point where economic impact sets in. And that is what we're now seeing, where the economic implications are there. And in that context, there are persons who want to find effective ways to distribute losses. Everybody suffers losses. And the question is, how do you distribute those losses? And that is what the dispute management element of it focuses on. Now, fortunately for me, as I said, we have three preeminent speakers who are going to help us to carry this discussion, reasoning as we call it, along a line to look at where we are, what some of the challenges are, what the next steps could be, and even consider some of the prospective ways that we could move forward to even become stronger than we were in the particular environment we're in. Now, I want to raise something prior to even introducing the speakers. I don't know how many persons are aware, but just a few days ago, we got news that Debenhams, which is this big um, department store chain, 242 years old, is in the process now of calling in liquidators. Now, that is a major chain. Now, once they get, get called in, persons may think of them as being simply a department store or what they offer. But the truth is, they have a host of arrangements around them, host relating to supply chains, financial services, and employment relations, and a host of other things that are happening. And the question is, what are the disputes that are likely to come out of that? What are the insolvency implications, if any? What are the getting rid of employees, for want of a better expression, implications, if any? What are the arrangements with their suppliers, their end users, and everybody else that are there? And we have to be creative because those instances are not going to be unique as we continue in this period, which is, for the moment, indefinite and likely to drag on for much longer than many of us had anticipated. Now, having said that, I'm sure the expert speakers we have will do much better than I could at looking at some of those issues as we, as we seek to flesh them out. And for that, we have, as I said, three important speakers with us this, this afternoon. Firstly, I will introduce them. Ladies first, I was told. And, and in, in this instance, the lady among the three is Lucy Reed. Now, Lucy, for those persons who are in the dispute management field at all, her name would ring very loudly in any region of the world that you were to go. Simply call the name and persons would recognize who she is. But she's an arbitrator now. She practices and is, is, is in the area specifically, most importantly, in investor state. And these are the words, complex international commercial disputes. She doesn't deal with anything that's not complex these days. And she is a member of arbitration chambers and is currently based in New York, having spent quite a bit of time in Asia and elsewhere as well. She is the current president of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration and vice president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center Court. And I could go on, including the fact that she was a professor at Singapore National University. And she was, of course, a partner in the firm of Freshfields, where she led their international arbitration program. Of course, besides Lucy, we also have Francis Xavier, 
who is also a preeminent practitioner in the field. He is based in Singapore and is a senior counsel there and head regional head for dispute resolution group of Raja and Tan Singapore, which is the biggie of the firms in that region. His practice areas include international arbitration, treaty arbitration, commercial litigation, and so on. And he is in fact, at the moment, president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the immediate past president of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, the Asia Pacific Bar Association. Now he is a panelist for multiple international organizations as well. And insofar as his area of practice is concerned, he is significantly involved in litigation and in arbitration as well. The third speaker is Robert Vaughan and about him I will start by simply saying something that he will recognize, that a city set on a hill cannot be hid. The fact is that we're both Boboites, both of us went to Monroe, he was the year after I, I was there. And he has distinguished himself by reference to that motto and including as a partner in the firm of Kim Vaughan Lerner, which is based in Fort Lauderdale. He's chair of the commercial business and litigation group there. And his practice areas focuses on again, commercial litigation and related fields, products, liability and arbitration. He is, has held several service, service positions and is currently the president of the Broad County Bar Association and past president of the Caribbean Bar Association and a member of the Dean's Advisory Group for Florida International University. We have among these three persons and these three persons collectively, as good a group as we could ever find anywhere. And we are sure that we will enjoy the reasoning that we're going to have with them. Now to start it off, and it was a little difficult to see how we got to this point. I will ask Francis really to lay the ground for what it is that he sees as some of the challenges that are out there in the field at the moment and how it is that he thinks we can, in a very short way, look to that and then we'll take the reasoning from there. Francis? Let me, let me just uh, give a sort of a broad outline. Thanks, uh, Christopher, for that. Now, I think in Asia, we, especially in Asia, and I'm sure the same experience is being replicated across the planet. Um, many, of, I mean, Sharon, Therese, uh, Sean spoke about it. The scale of the problem that we are facing is unprecedented. Um, you know, we haven't seen the actual uh, tsunami of disputes hit the courts, uh, but we know it's coming, right? Uh, as lawyers, uh, dispute lawyers all across the world, uh, we are, you know, we are seeing, we are seeing it coming. Now, and in the face of this uh, unprecedented, what Sharon called the disputes pandemic, uh, which is coming, what we have in, in a common law country like Jamaica uh, across the world, and we have the concepts of force majeure, uh, we have the concepts of frustration, uh, and in court countries, of course, we have a similar concept uh, to force majeure. Uh, but, you know, the, these concepts are simply not designed to deal with what we are facing. It's designed to deal with extraordinary, you know, one contract or a series of contracts um, that may be affected, but not on this scale, right? And so what do we do? Um, so first of all, I think many countries across the globe have tried to at least halt uh, or put, put on a moratorium uh, to, to have a suspensory effect on commerce um, so, you know, we have got, you know, uh, many, many countries, Germany, Australia, Singapore, uh, the UK, as an example, uh, we've, we've called a moratorium. That is, you know, you can't proceed with insolvency proceedings, bankruptcy proceedings. Um, and they've also gone ahead to try and regulate commerce, right? So in Singapore, we've got measures which say, um, you know, uh, tenants, commercial tenants get, you know, effectively three months off without paying rent during a period of say six months uh, or nine months. Uh, but really the question for us is what's, because uh, countries are grappling with the problem as it's unraveling. We, we never expected to be in the grip of the pandemic in August. We, we still are in the grip of the pandemic and we don't know how long it's gonna last. And so looking ahead, uh, Christopher, I think the question is, I think one thing is clear, 
right? Our laws as designed, our courts as designed are ill-equipped to deal with this tsunami. So the question is, where do we go from here? I think number one, and governments are grappling with it, is as Sharon says, we do need legislative inter intervention. This, this can't be every dispute goes through the courts or arbitration as we know it. Uh, because you know, we're in the great age of uncertainty and, and businesses, you know, and as uh, Malcolm has said, you know, revered names are crashing. They're about to crash, you know, and, and just not one. Many, many names are already in deep trouble. We know that as lawyers, they, they're consulting us. Um, so we really need legislation and there's a big challenge. Uh, it's not easy to regulate commerce at this scale um, and to prescribe a remedy. You can do it for landlord tenancy cases. Maybe that's more straightforward. But how do you do it for more complex uh, contractual arrangements, joint ventures? Um, and, you know, even if Singapore, certain countries put in very advanced permanent solutions, I don't see it in the landscape at the moment, but even if countries manage to do it, most of our transactions are cross-border. How do you really regulate cross-border transactions? They spend more than one national, uh, municipal, uh, you know, jurisdictional boundary. That's one. Number two, I think we, we really, but the solution, the only way to cut through the problem and to remove the uncertainty, I think the uncertainty can't be completely removed. You do need legislative intervention, but the nature of the intervention is going to be difficult. Conceptually, it's, it's quite difficult. You do need specialist tribunals to be appointed um, to not deal with situations based on right and wrong. Do you satisfy the high threshold of frustration? Uh, is the contract dead or is the contract suspended? You really need equity and fairness. You need tribunals looking at it and saying, look, guys, I mean, this pandemic, you know, that's that's threatened humanity um, is, is, is not something we can, you know, we can have individuals uh, fighting wars the way we know it, right? Everyone looks at litigation or arbitration like a mini Alexander going to war, right? And that just doesn't work. Uh, and, and, and I think as, as the speakers, the key speakers have, have said, this mindset does not work for the pandemic. And maybe it's time for us to look at, look at dispute resolution afresh. We certainly need mediation, some form of mediation. Now with the uh, advent of the Singapore Mediation Convention, maybe that gives us an opportunity. But really, I think what we are facing is number one, something unprecedented. Two, something that our current, the way we organize our legal systems just can't cope with, can't handle, uh, can't wrap its head around fully. People don't have the money to fight, fight wars the way they've known it. There's blood everywhere, you know, and we need quick solutions which are fair and we just need to move on to rebuild, uh, you know, what, what, what is collapsing all around us. And I think, um, you know, we need something that solves problems fast and that is mediatory rather than confrontational. Um, thank you, Malcolm, and I hand it over back to you. Thank you very much. Now, thanks, Francis. And as I listened to you and I saw Lucy nodding her head as somebody who primarily practices as an arbitrator, I, I really had to think of how Lucy deals with some of these issues because the truth is there are mediation solutions that we're going to have to look at. It is also true, I believe, that even before we get there, we're going to have to start looking much more seriously at good offices and all those softer, softer mechanisms that we could call upon to help us. But clearly there's still a space for litigation. There's still a space for arbitration. The question is how do we manage that process? And it would be instructive to hear Lucy as her view as to what generally the, the, the situation has, has unraveled for us or is unraveling as the case may be and how she views it with her deep, both national experience and international cross-border experience as well in terms of where we are and some of the issues in a very preliminary way that we have to be grappling with and how we may be considering the way forward. Lucy? Thank you uh, for having me, everyone. Uh, and I have to say in listening for the last 40 minutes, I've completely changed how I want to use my amount of time uh, in, this, in this program. And I'll, I'll tell you what, well, I'll start by saying as a full-time arbitrator where we have been focusing on pandemic effects is how to manage cases that are in process. 
How do we have hearings with Zoom? How do we deal with witnesses? How do we deal with parties that don't that are going to postpone, want to postpone until there can be in-person hearings for strategic reasons? How do we deal with the equality of arms when you've got a party in a country without a reliable internet? Can all those things for, for what's in the pipeline. But I'm much more interested, especially in this conversation about what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, and I, I readily endorse the whole mediation approach. When I was, in, my focus when I was at NUS teaching actually was on teaching uh, mediation and conciliation of investor state and state to state disputes. And there's a good offices you've mentioned, there's a lot to explore there because governments are involved. Governments are going to have to be involved because whenever you're talking about loss and claims, you need sources of money. Uh, and one source, as we know already from, from governments giving uh, stipends to people, et cetera, is governments. But what I want to raise is, because it's a reasoning, is most people don't focus on the fact that a lot of my career has been spent in claims programs. Uh, I, was the, I was involved as a private lawyer and then in the U.S. government with the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal. And after the Iranian revolution, hundreds and hundreds of individual US and other companies brought individual lawsuits against Iran and their national courts. They all got wiped out in order to be repackaged and go to this new international tribunal in The Hague, which had money to distribute to those who could prove loss. That was pretty litigious. There was also the UN Compensation Commission after the Gulf War, where with a pot of money, which came, well, that's a long story, I don't wanna go into, but uh, there was no reason to prove liability. The, those who suffered, particularly workers, guest workers in that war, if they could show that they had been in, the, in, in um, Kuwait and had to leave and had bosses, they were paid a certain amount of money. There was the Eritrea Ethiopia, Eritrea, Ethiopia Claims Commission, where I was a, a commissioner. That, that was a humanitarian law commission where the victims of the war who had suffered uh, claims brought them against each other, Could the governments brought them. Uh, and the last thing I mention is all of the post-World War II claims commissions. There was one set up by the German Insurance Fund for those who had been defrauded of their insurance payments. And then I was working at the special Swiss bank claims resolution tribunal to return funds that had gotten caught uh, in the Swiss banking uh, system during the Holocaust. Again, based on pro rata distribution to people in need. So these claims programs can be very creative. And I would, as Francis said, I would like to hear people talking about claims programs, mediation programs. We did that after September 11th, by the way, in the United States. Uh, there was a fund to be distributed to victims. It takes creativity. It takes lawyers and judges and arbitrators stopping from thinking about case by case, one claim against another, even force majeure arose. Uh, and you always need money. And what this, I, I thinking out loud, it's a reasoning, but I just saw in the paper today, who is making money now? Massive amounts of money. Uh, it's Amazon and Apple and Zoom and the IT providers who are now have services that everybody needs. If, if we, maybe people will start thinking about a small tax on those new profits that come from the pandemic to be redistributed to victims from the pandemic, particularly workers, particularly the essential workers. So I would, I, I could go on and on about how to run an arbitration during the, the pandemic. That's not what we're here to talk about. I think it's, it's very important to start thinking about new ideas to avoid individual claims and try to deal with more um, mass um, justice. So that's all I have to say, Christopher. Let me ask the the, 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 the Lucy, because for me, the question coming out of that is from your vantage point, what are some of the issues you see already popping up and the big ones on the horizon that you see from a cross-border international perspective in, in, in the well, dispute management field? In, in my normal life um, of complex commercial disputes or investor state disputes, I see as many parties saying, why bother? 
to bring cases when we know the other side is suffering as much as we're suffering. Um, ICSID, I'm told, has not seen any pandemic-based cases yet. Uh, I think SEAC has just had a, a few commercial cases that have come up. So we have to keep that in mind. It's, it's, um, we also have to remember that a lot of the reason that after a, a situation like this, a company or an individual brings a claim is in hopes of getting insurance. Um, and I would hope as we did in September 11th in the United States that there be an immediate, um, I don't know who would, who would bring it, um, convene insurance companies to try to come up with claims programs and distribution um, of, of insurance proceeds rather than, fighting, rather than fighting every case. Maybe we have IDB, maybe we have OECD, maybe we have the World Bank, maybe we have groups of, of nations come together. And then you can, it's easy. I mean, I've done it so many times. It's actually easy to categorize, categorize claims by the amount of loss, by the type of loss. Um, you have a claims form system that's all online of minimal proof of reality. There's, there's rarely fraud actually in these claims programs uh, and focus uh, not on liability, but on entitlement. Robert, to go much into what Elsie had to say, I'll just jump in there. I know Robert, you do a bit of work. Some quite a bit of work in the area of insurance. And of course, that area of business interruption clearly is an issue both at domestic and, and cross-border level. And what are you already seeing from your own practice? And what do you perceive to be emerging areas coming out of that? And how do you think we are, we are going to be able to deal with them as they manifest the issues, that is? Thanks for having me, Chris. You know, it's always... Um, an unenviable task to go after speakers as eloquent and as um, capable and competent and as experienced as the ones that you've gathered here. So um, I, I don't envy me right about now. Uh, the, the, the issue of claims coming out of this pandemic, the issue of business, the, the possibility of business interruption claims, Lucy just alluded to, and her very last sentence, I know she said that on purpose to, to spur conversation and prompt the discussion was that the focus in such a model, one that is akin to a claims tribunal and there are commercial examples that I'm sure she would have gone into next, the BP um, claims tribunal, the Enron claims tribunal. And of course she made reference to 9-11 the focus of such a model would necessarily have to skip over the most contentious part of such a model, which is we're not talking about liability. We're talking about entitlement. And with respect to entitlement, uh, you know, she's absolutely right that the, the, the model would be one focused, in, focused on determining uh, an appropriate pro rata distribution of a corpus of funds that's been determined necessary to compensate and or rehabilitate a group, an industry, a sector, a, a set of individuals, whoever it is that, that, that would be the beneficiaries of this tribunal and this model. The problem with that though is that last sentence, liability. Um, here we're talking about not an incident that can be labeled um, one that is the basis of someone's or an, a company's negligence, um, not one that's based upon the malfeasance or, or purposeful act of a group or entity or a state actor. We're talking about a virus. Who gets labeled, who gets tagged with the um, negative impact of a pandemic. Um, of course, the question, you know, that necessarily will flow from that is, is this really, you know, as, as Lucy was alluding to, an issue of liability per se, or is it just a question of insuring for um, uh, un, unwanted consequence? Are we just merely saying, well, um, that's what insurance is for? Um, that begs the question, you know, are there exclusions that apply? 
the, 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 the cases that are starting to arise with respect to business interruption claims are being forcefully met with defenses of exclusions, uh, which typically would have exclusions for force majeure, unintended um, and unanticipated uh, negative consequences, um, acts of God. Many would try to argue that a pandemic, a virus, you know, something that is arguably not man-made, still, you know, a pending question, uh, would fit into that category and those arguments are being made forcefully. Um, so we, even within the insurance context, even when we're talking about avoiding liability in, uh, in the traditional sense in terms of either negligence or malfeasance or purposeful act, but we're talking about purely an insurance context. Um, the question is whether or not this pandemic is going to fall squarely into one of those exclusions, um, which normally would include a scenario like a pandemic, normally would, would include a scenario such as the one we're dealing with here. Um, and, and then of course, you know, you, as we were talking about, and I love your phrase, dispute management and managing anticipated losses. Uh, we start talking about whether or not uh, there is a distinction between uh, disputes and difficulties uh, based upon contractual relations, contractual relationships, I should say, that were in existence pre-pandemic, as opposed to relationships that arose during the pandemic. Do those have different treatments? Francis made reference to the fact that it's one thing to be dealing with disputes that are pending and have been impacted by the pandemic and its impact on our justice system, impact on our dispute resolution system. What about relationships that arose during the pandemic? Do those relationships and problems that you know may arise because the pandemic is more prolonged, more deep, more widespread, having more of an impact on supply chains than any of us could have or did anticipate, will those disputes or should those disputes be treated differently? Our defenses to inability to perform the same for folks who entered into a relationship pre-pandemic as they are for folks who entered into a relationship in the midst of the pandemic? Do they have the same notice defenses? Do they have the same force majeure um, and or act of God defenses when they entered into this eyes wide open? So, you know, um, I'm not quite sure how deeply you want us to start going into uh, some of those questions as a, trial lawyer, somebody made reference to Alexander the Great, it was Francis, and going into battle. I'm going to take that one as one of those many Alexanders who are constantly marching into battle. Um, the little things, the procedural questions that dictate the process of litigation and trial, while they may be de minimis for those of us not standing in the courtroom, they are extremely important. Questions of due process, questions of you know, the, the handling and management of evidence, question of confronting your opponent or accuser, questions of having a jury of your peers dealing with a dispute. These are all questions that need to be answered um, in a manner that does not create a set of appeals and disputes that need to be retried because we have forced our way into an experimental stage of dispute resolution through expedience. So um, as you can tell, I can geek out on these conversations for hours. I'm going to stop there <laughs> so that we can ask another question and, and get some other folks involved. Francis, I, I, I know that I just had to comment with you on this. Yeah? Banking and finance is a little area that I have particular interest in. And, you know, one of the things that G.B. Gladstone said in his 1890s articles of finance was that finance, so to speak, is the heart of the economy from which other organs state their tone. And I think even in a pandemic that applies. 
Now, I know you practice in the area of banking and, dis and, 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 and finance disputes. And where there are pandemic and the implications, one of the areas you feel it most, most readily, is stock market values, all the other things that flow from it, would be in the area of banking and finance and people really coming down to brass stacks. Where is my money? How am I to deal with it? What are some of the issues you see already emerging in your area of practice and how widespread you think it is and how much worse do you think the area of banking and finance will get? And what are some of the, 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 the stopgap measures you think we could be thinking of as we're thinking of disputes in that area? Malcolm, was that question directed at me? And I wasn't sure that uh, I heard you properly. It's always at you, Francis. Yes, it was. <laughs> Sorry, it was at you. <laughs> Right, right. Now, we, we, we are seeing, uh, you know, um, we are seeing a large amount of disputes in the shadows uh, in that area, uh, principally because the pandemic, as we all know it, has shut down large swaths of uh, commercial activity. I mean, it has even managed to shut down the courts. Uh, no, no one has been immune. So, uh, you know, you have financing arrangements, um, for practically, you know, every other or every commercial transaction. And so, you know, um, as you put it, um, Chris, earlier, it's, it's and, you know, most commercial arrangements are not standalone. They, they, you're talking about a chain, uh, you know, and each bit of the chain is dependent on the other bit. Um, and all of the bits have links to financial arrangements. So, you know, you're seeing, you know, a multi-dimensional problem. And certainly from a banking finance perspective, there are huge problems. Um, you know, every time, and, and you see Zara in trouble, you see GNC in trouble, you, uh, you mentioned the Benham, and these are the names you see in the press. But, you know, there are giants that are tottering, right? Um, and um, look, it's, it's so huge that, you know, even the banks, uh, you know, can't get a grip on what needs to be done. Um, I think every sector of the industry is grappling with how do we even approach it? And, uh, you know, as they're grappling with the solution, the problem is still, uh, it's continuing. And, and, and the longer this co continues, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult problem. So, so I think to answer your question, Chris, I think certainly banking and finance is at the heart of it because, uh, you know, the financial uh, institutions would have financed, you know, the bulk of the commercial arrangements that are in dire, in dire straits. Uh, and, you know, I think I, I just want to, uh, you know, put a keen finger on the point um, that Lucy made, and I think that's an excellent suggestion. We can't solve, the courts can't solve this problem, right? Individual arbitrators can't solve this problem. We need, we need and even, even government standing alone may not be able to solve this problem because, you know, um, and I think, you know, as you've made the point, Robert has made the point, and a number of speakers have made the point, we are dealing in a world which is interconnected like never before, uh, we're talking about cross-border, multilateral transactions, uh, interactions. We need governments to come together. And, you know, one of the problems that Lucy put a keen finger on the pulse of was, how do we raise this war chest, right? A lot of money has gone into bandages and temporary fixes, which have taken already billions and billions of dollars uh, just to keep businesses from crashing to the ground. But how do you resolve, right? Um, one doesn't know how long the pandemic is going to be with us. At the moment, you know, we are all staring with disbelief at the fact that we are in August and there's no respite in sight. Um, so this is a big issue. I think one needs to look at how to raise the watches and that's something, you know, uh, and I entirely agree. And I think this suggestion of Lucy that one looks at the, you know, uh, reparation claims on a large scale of the kind that Lucy spoke about, maybe that is the model that government should be looking at. Um, and as Robert has emphasized, uh, not a question of strict liability and uh, you know, entitlement as a matter of law, who is right 
uh, who can, you know, what are the what are the legal effects of force majeure? Um, but really, you know, um, having a sort of a reparation scheme where we can just move on and make sure that commerce stays alive, uh, the lifeblood of uh, of transactions that we all need, uh, you know, on the planet uh, to to be sustained. Back to you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Francis. And I, I'm going to get back to you in a minute, but we'll speak to Lucy shortly on it prior. And I want you, Francis, in the interim to think of whether or not the court, the model of the court as we have had it over the last several centuries, many centuries, is a model that now needs significant overhaul. You don't have to answer me yet. I'm going to ask Lucy. Now, Lucy, one of the areas, I know you, you do a lot of investor state work, and a lot of investor state disputes arise in the areas relating to infrastructure and, and those sorts of things. And the question is, what are some of the challenges you're seeing, with, or, or even, even if not yet manifested, likely to manifest in the area of cross-border investment, and how it is that you think, given the pandemic implications, those are likely to affect economies generally, particularly developing economies, and the way we move forward and what models you think we could be thinking of responsibly. I know there's a general fit that you have spoken about, but are there any things that the small developing or emerging economies could be doing to assist them going forward in, 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 in some of the pandemic implications that could come out of, of what we're having? Thank you. Sorry, I lost my internet for a minute. Um, it's very predictable to me having seen cases in the past, uh, uh, many cases um, involve tourism and hotels where a foreign investor has invested heavily in a developing country for tourism, a whole hotel complex, and then because of some regulation or a government action, allegedly, it goes under. And so that leads to a, an investor state claim that will go on for, well, some disappear quickly, but some go on for two or three or four years and tens of millions of dollars are spent on attorney's fees and experts fees. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to criticize that, but when you think that what governments are doing now is in the public health, uh, I would like to think that rather than have investors and in, including insurers subrogated spending all that money to go after governments that have shut down projects, that have um, you know, cut off all visitors at all, that there will be a defense to that. And rather than go through the case by case focus like that, we would instead, as I've said before, try to get some collaboration to help the sectors, to help the industries and um, um, discourage. I'm an arbitrator, I know, but to discourage using the old patterns going forward, particularly with the um, it very unbalanced impact on the developing world and on certain sectors from this pandemic. You know, last night, um, someone said that for my generation, this is the first time we've been able to think like our parents thought after World War II that it is something that so changes life, not just for a few years, but for the decades to come. And so many people need rescuing uh, and need to change that, that we really do need world leadership. And Therese said she's an optimist and so am I usually, but I remember when I was at, uh, in Asia, people would say, how can the US be so politically divided? How can it be so fractured? And I used to say, well, maybe we need a real catastrophe or a war or a pandemic to bring us together to start helping each other more uh, as, as we heard Michelle Obama say the other night. So far, I'm not seeing that. And I, that's very discouraging to me. It's, it's me against them or us against them. And, and we as lawyers and members of the bar uh, who are on this call, I, I think have a role to play to encourage, um, encourage those we advise not to be Alexanders, sorry, Francis, not just immediately to go to war. 
Um, and there are lots, there's a lot that could be done. And I want to say again that it's important to look to who has the money, whether it's the Marshall Plan, the Victors, whatever, who has small amounts of money from huge amounts of earnings that could make large differences uh, to those at, who get the short end of the stick in a, in a health crisis like this. Sorry, I feel like I'm preaching. Robert, let me, let me ask you, and I know Robert, you, you practice in the area of employment and related oh. litigation as well, yes? <laughs> not, not specially, but go ahead. Not specially, but I know, I know you touched some of that yourself. Now, the area of employment, you met, it was mentioned a little earlier, is an area which has special, in fact, Therese has, had spoken about it earlier. It's an area which everything ultimately has some impact on employment, eh? And there are special considerations there for law, all sorts of issues that arise in the context of, of, of employment. And if it is frankly that we're not able to manage effectively those employer employee relationships, we could find ourselves in some very long standing problems going forward at, at all sorts of levels. Riots, everything else could flow from it quite frankly. And the question is, what are the creative solutions that you think we should be looking at, have in regard to employment, to ensure that going forward, we work as best as we can and, and coming out of this, this, this pandemic? Well, if, if I pretended to have the answer to that question, I, I would be one of those people that Lucy would be pointing to in terms of redistribution of wealth, because um, <laughs> I would have a lot more to bottle and sell. Um, you know, I'm going to take some liberties, Chris, because I'm going to ask if I can answer that question at a more macro level, because the employer-employee relationship that you are alluding to and um, the, the, the creative solutions that may be employed to resolve the issues faced by the employee, individual employee, are to a large extent the very same problem that Lucy just talked about at a macro level, where we're talking about industry participants uh, individually, if you can use that term, trying to figure out how to get through and survive the effects of a pandemic when they're a small part of a supply chain where in that same chain, you have a significant dichotomy between the haves and the have nots. You have a part of that supply chain, a part of the economy that is thriving in this pandemic. And then the tail end of that supply chain or the back end or whichever part of that chain you want to describe it, at, describe it as, that is essentially dying on the vine. And the question is, um, you know, as Lucy just described it, one argument, one description is that there is one part of that chain that is benefiting from this pandemic. While there's another part of the su supply chain that in many respects contributes to their success, but doesn't reap the benefit just by virtue of where they are in the chain. They're not providing the supplies to the individual consumer. They're providing um, three or four stages down the chain. They are a related enterprise or rel related industry. Um, they are the, 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 the alternate to the online provider that is now being able to benefit because while everything else is shut down, they're able to thrive. Should that be something dealt with at the public law level, as opposed to the private law level where there is individual dispute resolution mechanisms that we're accustomed to and that we see every day? To answer you whether or not there are creative solutions that ought to be applied to the individual employer, the next question has to be, is that an employer that is benefiting from creative solutions themselves? Is that someone that is benefiting from a PPE program, a government program, a subsidized program that is allowing that individual or that company to survive and thrive in the pandemic? And do they have related obligations going down the chain to the individual employee? If not, then what you're creating 
is an unfortunate circumstance where you're creating an obligation for the employer without regard for whether or not there are opportunities and um, pipelines for that employer to themselves survive in this pandemic. It's, it's, it's the situation we look on. I think Francis talked about moratoriums that are in place for mortgage holders, um, the tenants. I, I think you mentioned in Singapore, Xavier, um, uh, Francis, the same thing is true to an extent here where there is a moratorium on foreclosures, a moratorium on evictions, but the conversation at the landlord level, at the building owner level, is woefully inadequate. So you have this really impossible scenario where at the end of the moratorium, there's an accelerated obligation on the part of the tenant, the mortgagee, to pay out. But with what? There is a continuing obligation on the part of the business owner, the landlord, to service their debt. But how? <laughs> and then there are the banks that are wallowing in wealth. And the supply chain is truncated. It doesn't go all the way through because there isn't a contemplation of you know, feeding that supply chain all the way around, which begs the question that Lucy was alluding to, should we be contemplating some sort of public law reallocation mechanism? Because this is not ripe for individual dispute resolution. As you like to say, the, the, the dispute management component here is maybe not the way to go because there really isn't a legitimate dispute generated by one party's malfeasance or negligence. So I agree it may require a global reevaluation, not only of the dispute resolution itself, but the definition of a dispute. Is that landlord-tenant dispute really a landlord-tenant issue or is it a reallocation of resources issue? Did the tenant really fail or did the supply chain fail? And if the supply chain fail, is that resolved in a landlord tenant scenario or somewhere else? Okay, before we take a few questions, Francis, I had promised you that I wanted you to look back at whether or not the litigation system or the court system as we have known it is now in need of fundamental reevaluation. And if it is, or even if it is not, is there a way we can better complement it to ensure that it works better, especially having regard to the circumstances we're in? And even before you answer that, the question is, coming out of this, do you see us going back to the court system as we have known it? Or is it even in our best interest to go back to that court system as we have known it? I think, Chris, that's a great question. And I agree with Lucy that the pandemic hopefully wakes us up. Because for centuries, uh, you know, leave aside the pandemic, we, we now are faced with the fact that the way we resolve disputes, as we know it, apart from mediation and maybe med up, uh, is not equipped to deal with the pandemic. But leaving the pandemic aside, you know, uh, common law countries like us especially, uh, we need to take a hard look at the way we've approached litigation. Now, many of us continue to fight cases. Robert mentioned, uh, uh, you know, I look around the room. Lucy has been a gladiator for many years before. You know, she's become a full-time arbitrator. Chris, you, you've known what that involves. Um, uh, so, so, so does Rose and many of us here, right? Uh, and in every case that we've fought bitterly in court, let's be frank, there's someone, one or more parties are being obstinate, are being difficult, are being cantankerous, if you can put it that way, right? And so we, we you know, we speak the language of war, right? And, uh, and what do the courts do? They, 
you know, the, the, the judge is like a referee, right? He sits back and says, look, I've got the civil procedure rules on one end and I've got the hard law on the other. And, I, you know, there are rules of engagement and, um, you know, we go through that. But the question is, look, you know, if you were to ask most people here who've been involved in disputes, in fact, we, we've, we continue to earn a li livelihood uh, fighting wars. And do we really believe in the system that this is the best way to resolve disputes? Well, I certainly don't. And I'm sure many others here would feel the same way. And I think, and I think you know, look, in the 1700s, if you went to court and you went to court today, beyond the pandemic, nothing would have changed. The gap, perhaps, the case law cited, perhaps. Uh, so, you know, uh, we've never stopped and paused and thought, you know, is there a more enlightened way of doing this? And without the pandemic, I agree with Lucy, we, we would not, not have taken stock. Perhaps this is our opportunity, right? And I think, and I think we, need, we need a court, even in common law countries, fused with civil law powers. To say right at the beginning, you know, when it has the second uh, case management conference to say, you know, really, aren't we going through this, uh, this battle royale that is looming the wrong way, right? And to have an, an armory of, you know, a more advanced armory, not just saying, I'm going to let you guys go away and I'm going to force you to go away and do, do a, a, you know, spend a day at mediation and come back if you can't resolve and then we continue. Uh, playing Monopoly like before, or, 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 or the, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, some, some war game. Uh, but to really say, you know, really the solution here is here. And I'm going to direct parties to do ABC, to head in that direction, taking into account, you know, the legal position of the parties, taking in, into account what makes sense, you know, for, for, for the commercial parties to move ahead. So Chris, I agree. But that is a larger issue that governments and, you know, um, uh, you know, individually and collectively need to look at, you know, and I think, you know, um, you know, if you talk to somebody like Lucy, Robert, Sean, you know, many people here, we'll have many ideas how a court can be in, infused with power to be cr truly enlightened, to take an enlightened approach, uh, despite parties who want to be obstinate you know, dig into their own trenches and, you know, and point uh, armed weapons at the other side. You know, I think the judge, the, the court system needs to be revamped uh, to take an enlightened approach. And I think many of us would have many ideas, but this is not a conversation we can resolve uh, in a webinar. <laughs> uh, back to you, Chris. Chris, Chris. Yes. I, I, think, I think Francis did that on purpose to, 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 to force one of us to step up and defend the trial bar and the, the trials as the foundation in many respects of a democratic society. And I, I saw the smirk on his face as he was doing that. So I know he was teasing someone and I thought Justice McCullough was gonna jump in, but I had to say something because I would lose my trial badge if I did not defend it. I agree that as a form of dispute, uh, dispute resolution, Trials can be, if not properly managed, if not, as Francis said before, handled with the rules of engagement adhered to, they can get unwieldy, they can get expensive, they can appear brutish. But at the end of the day, I firmly believe, and it's in my DNA, I firmly believe that resolution in trial by a jury of your peers, commercial or otherwise, is a fundamental tenet of democratic society. Now that said, should we not be looking at more efficient ways of utilizing ADR, mediation, arbitration, to complement trial as a, as a means of dispute resolution? Absolutely. We're being forced in the pandemic to look at as you so eloquently say all the time, Chris, managing loss, managing disputes. Can we articulate in our relationships, contractual relationships and other relationships, areas that can be 
subject to mediation, um, arbitration, etc. There are certain types of business torts, certain other, um, uh, you know, deviations from normal relationships that necessarily need a jury of peers um, to, to, to be resolved. And when managed properly, there is nothing more beautiful to experience, I think. It's, it's expensive, but it's beautiful to experience. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, what Francis is talking about is now everything is before the courts and anyone and at any time for any reason, efficient or not, I lament all the time that I feel like I can't afford my own services. That's an access to justice issue, right? Which we have to be looking at. There are people entering into relationships right at the crest of this pandemic where they're afraid to enter into the relationship as a small business because if the projections are impacted by the pandemic, there is no way they can afford the dispute resolution costs and expenses that go along with a trial. That should never be the case. And that's where um, supplements to trials and, and litigation as dispute resolution mechanisms should be explored, um, should become a part of our you know, day to day dispute resolution uh, modalities. So, yes, I agree. But, you know, Francis, I had to jump in to defend the trials. It's not only my lifeblood, it's in my DNA. I can't help it. All right, let me, there, there's a question for you directly, Lucy, which I'll ask. And the, the person, who is James Kitt is asking whether or not you could elaborate a little on the issue of entitlement allocation and how you think it could be ruled out. Okay, uh, happy to do that. First, uh, first, I will underscore what Robert said. I think there will always be cases that need courtrooms and trials and real war. There always will be. Um, I also think, though, in, in a short number of months, we have learned that a, a lot of the expense of even those wars could be cut back by, you know, having witnesses who are far away appear on video or having case management be done remotely rather than everyone trucking into court and having to sit all day waiting. So we've learned, even we gladiators have learned something. Let me give you... Um, to answer the question, I'll give you an example using the landlord tenant situation that, uh, that Robert talked about. So say, just to say, for example, uh, in a metropolitan area or uh, a, even a small country were to say, we're gonna have a commission to look at all the claims by landlords who haven't been getting their full rent because there's been um, a moratorium on rent payments. And, what not looking at liability means, case by case, every landlord and tenant, there would be no requirement that the tenant prove that he or she actually couldn't pay and needed that subsidy. Because you can imagine the landlord saying, that's a rich person, so how come he didn't have to pay or she didn't have to pay? You don't look at that. You just say, anyone who can show he was a landlord during the year or eight months or whatever the period is and didn't get rent is entitled to a flat fee or a percentage of rent from the tenant. Uh, or you might look at the other way, the tenants would, would not have to show that they could or couldn't afford it, but a fund would have been set up by all the landlords or from taxpayer money uh, in order to pay a, a flat compensation. You just don't have to spend all the money on proving liability. Uh, if you're talking about distribution of funds to those who just show they were in the status that makes them entitled to whatever kind of compensation is defined. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Now, Francis, I, I know in, in Asia, we have seen a lot of creative solutions in recent times come out of Asia in the area of dispute management. I can think, for example, of that AMA, arbitration, mediation, arbitration, way approach that was taken and still is, was very creative considered to be at the time and still does works in a very creative way. But the question is, what are some of the, and we're now trying to pin it down to some very clear and finite solutions. What are some of the creative one, two, three steps or solutions that you could think of to, as takeaways that persons may start creatively thinking of? For example, somebody with a, a, a customer with a banking dispute. What are some of the approaches that they should be thinking of to resolve that dispute that they may have with a bank? 
Well, you know, Chris, I think um, the experience in Asia is that really um, that one needs to explore mediation uh, to the fullest extent possible. Um, and I think um, given the, the, the structures that exist, the court structures that exist at the moment, I know, uh, you know, and perhaps, uh, you know, th this is sort of happening in the background. A number of uh, Asian countries uh, are looking to revamp uh, their civil procedure codes um, to, like I said, and, and I agree with what's been said by Robert, Lucy, there is a place for, you know, the classic trials, right? So if you have five disputes, perhaps two or even three, uh, may need to go through that process because that is the, the best justice resolution or, you know, dispute resolution process that, you know, mankind has devised. Uh, you know, you have the civil system and the, and the common law system. Uh, there is a sense, though, that especially for the remainder three or two, um, where parties are just digging into a trench for the sake of going into a war for strategic reasons, uh, not that it advances the cause of justice, you may need to infuse the court with greater powers, right? Uh, to sort of uh, bang heads in the hope that sparks of, uh, you know, common sense will, will then be generated and to infuse the court with greater power. But until that re revamp is sort of like rolled out, um, I, at the moment, you, you would see that the only viable option would be mediation. There is no other uh, solution to, to cut through the, you know, the dispute and resolve it. And of course, now with the, the advent of the Singapore Mediation Convention and, and you know, the large number of uh, countries that are signing on, you see, you're beginning to see real light at the end of the tunnel um, because people are taking uh, mediations a lot more seriously. And the, and the statistics uh, across Asia, um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't quite looked at worldwide figures, but the last I looked, statistics across Asia, 75 to 86 percent success rate Chris that's very very impressive um, and it and it kind of fits in with the ethos of you know many of the traditional um, the ways of looking at disputes in Asia uh, from the Confucianist uh, model and, and so on so at the moment in Asia the only viable option we are finding or seeing is mediation full-on or as you put it met up you know, arbitration fused with uh, mediation in some form, met up, met, or up, met up, you know. Um, so Chris, back to you. Yeah, thanks. And I'm going to get to Therese in particular now, because Therese, you would have heard the, these preeminent lawyers <laughs> speaking <laughs> some of these issues. And I know you've been itching from the economic perspective and particularly from the IDB. And some of the issues hopefully would have been evolved a little perhaps coming out of the, this conversation with our lawyers. But what are some of the challenges remaining that you see from the economic perspective and what would you like to see lawyers do in the context of these, these, these problems? Okay, am I muted? Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a fascinating discussion, right? Um, and to hear Lucy talk about, um, I think she, she used the phrase reparations, to have some kind of reparations committee. Um, I, I mean, I think this is a colossal problem. Um, you know, just this morning, and two things struck me this week. One um, was a, a document that came out, not document, but a letter that the Central Bank of the Bahamas sent to the commercial banks yesterday, stating that the payments that the government was making for unemployment insurance um, on behalf of people who lost jobs and so on could not be used to pay off any existing debt that, that the individual bank holders had. That caught my attention because I'm, I'm gonna link this back to the digital transformation discussion because I, had, I was, following um, what the National Insurance Board was doing and issuing checks to recipients of the unemployment benefits. And they were lined up, just like in Jamaica, we saw the way the care packages were being delivered by the government of Jamaica. People had to go to the stadium, go to these places, line up, risk their lives in COVID period to be you know, in a line to collect a check. Um, 
So that's one thing that was wrong, right? So why was, wasn't the money deposited directly to a bank account? When I asked the Minister of Finance in Bahamas what was going on, he basically said that people were begging them not to deposit the money into the banks because the banks were basically seizing the resources and people still couldn't buy food or pay their rent or whatever. I mean, that's just one example of how the spoils get redistributed, right? By people who have unequal power. So, you know, in my mind, because I'm an economist, the most efficient way to deliver the, the resources would be immediately deposited to a bank account. But on the bank side, the bank is looking at, well, this guy owes me for his car loan, owes me for his mortgage, owes me for whatever else. I'm gonna take out my money first and then whatever's left, it gets to put in the account. And so, this also erodes trust. And I want to talk a little bit too about, I think Lucy raised it and others, about what's breaking down in the whole multilateral trading system, right? We know that WTO is not working properly. We know that um, over the last five years, given the change in policy of the US administration, that there's been a sort of, um, how shall I call it, an undermining of multilateral institutions. And so to talk about, you know, trying to even organize arbitration across borders in a time of a pandemic, it boggles the mind where you even start. Because I think there are, you know, I started out by saying this conflict between employees and, and employers, um, government and the private sector, um, take the tourism industry, the tourism industry across this region are begging, is begging the, um, the governments to help them with the bailout of, of, of their properties and how to keep staff and what to do. And I mean, it's a mess. Um, and I, I mean, I just don't know. I, I think institutions like the IDB, this is not kind of a bread and butter, but obviously, um, given that we're also working with the private sector, these issues come up. But um, it hasn't really come to my attention that we've been involved in trying to arbitrate, so to speak, issues that didn't involve the bank itself with a client or with a government or, or some other you know, business that really affects just the bank. Now, clearly, when it comes to, you know, client, the client, creditor relations and the hierarchy of who comes first when a bailout is, is happening or when a country decides that they can't uh, repay their debt, who comes first, all that creditor status stuff. I mean, and I, I wish here, here, I wish I had some legal knowledge, but I don't. But I think um, you guys really have some difficult waters to navigate in this pandemic. I mean, I've also, the other piece that caught my attention this week is that constitutional jurists, and I saw it first happen in Jamaica, but I, I see it now happening in the Bahamas also, are taking, taking shots at the government for, governments for putting lockdowns in place, right? So, you know, in the case of Jamaica, and we have, um, um, we have others who are more qualified to talk about the, what the Jamaican constitution um, represents, but the disaster emergency powers that the government has to sort of put a quarantine in place around certain communities is being called into question on a constitutional basis. So the piece I was reading this morning on the Bahamas, I mean, this, this she is a former justice taking taking to task the government for putting a lockdown in place. So I think everything is kind of up in the air and it seems like we're falling into anarchy. So I'm hoping to hear from you guys I mean, how we can make sense of how complicated the world has become. Um, not just because our, it seems like our multilateral institutions are under threat, including by the way, <laughs> my own, because now the US is trying to impose um, a certain candidate on the next presidency in the whole election and, and the whole, I just feel like we're all in turmoil. Um, but uh, I find these times to be probably as challenging as the one, the ones at the end of the second world war where Churchill basically said, you know, 
this is the end of the beginning. This is not really the end of the mess. This is just the end of the beginning. And we really need to figure out how we're going to resolve it. But um, I think someone like me, and, I, and I've said this in our institution at the very highest levels, we have to admit when we don't have the, the answers. And I think I've spent many, many sleepless nights since, since early March thinking about what, can, what more can we do. Um, obviously, our, our first line of defense and support has been in the health sector to provide support for uh, small, medium enterprises to give credit guarantees, um, uh, support lines for governments to help out small businesses. Um, on the whole issue of, of you know, women and children at home being subject of domestic violence, drawing attention to the fact that this is based on our own surveys, more of that is happening now in COVID as people are in lockdown. And how do you address, you know, those those real complicated, difficult uh, family situations? Um, I think what's on the table now uh, is really taxing, and I think policymakers everywhere, institutions like like yours, um, globally, uh, we just need to to to. You know, bring the best minds to bear on these issues, and I think it's also a time, as somebody mentioned, to sort of question. You know, are we really living in a fair system? I mean, we know that inequities exist. We know that from the data. We see Gini coefficients for some countries getting worse, meaning that you know, more people at the top are gobbling up the biggest share of the resources, and a lot of people at the bottom are not. Um, and they're all manner of ways we know that inequalities exist in our societies, but I think when we are face to face with with a, a global pandemic that is really not partial to where you fall in the income quintile, right? You can be poor, you can be very rich, and you can still be affected by this pandemic. Um, but I think without a doubt, we know from our own work that, of course, people in low income brackets are being more severely affected than others. Um, I just think it's really, really hard when resources are so severely constrained and where multilateral institutions are, are being, um, I would say, being threatened by, by the shareholders, including the biggest shareholder, which is the United States, and it's you know, pulling back its, its, its support from an institution like the World Health Organization. I mean, could the IDB be next? Could the IMF be next? Could the World Bank be next? We don't know. Um, but I think it's a very, very challenging time to be alive and to be working on these difficult issues. Um, so I think we want to hear from you guys, because if you have something concrete that we can possibly work on, whether it's to reshape the, the legislative agenda around arbitration and, you know, what that, whatever that means um, in this current context, then I think we'd be open to share that with the governments we're working with. Thank you. That was a long answer. Sorry. Karen, you're industrial. In fact, Lucy mentioned that, you know, infrastructure and so on and foreign investment going in very often goes in the hospitality industry. It's an industry you know well. The liberty I take is to ask you, what are some of the real challenges that you, I know you're very experienced with things across the Caribbean. What are some of the challenges that you have seen? And what are some of the, in a very short way, you would say some of the things that you would like to see dealt with? particularly with, from, a, from a dispute management perspective. Thank you, Christopher. Um, it's, what can I say about the industry right now? It is very, um, very, very challenging as, um, as, as, the whole, as the whole world is. From a, from a dispute standpoint, what, um, what we're, we're seeing um, are challenges with, um, where it relates to um, borders being uh, borders being closed, and um, with borders being closed, it creates an even um, bigger challenge for um, businesses as well as employees. Um, borders being closed for us in tourism means um, absolutely um, n very little, uh, very little business. So you're seeing um, disputes arising out of, especially from a tourism board perspective, um, you see disputes arising out of um, contracts um, that have had to possibly be uh, truncated, again, trying to exercise um, 
uh, force, uh, force majeure. We're seeing um, challenges with, with guests, um, having disputes with tour operators um, because contracts were originally signed for, um, for vacations and tour operators as well as hotels are not necessarily refunding um, refund starting to see possible disputes as it relates with, um, for example, um, grant situations where, um, for example, government has grants uh, in place and the way in which the, um, the grants are being, the criteria that's being used in terms of whether employees qualify for, um, for these grants uh, or again, whether an employer is put in a situation where um, there's, um, there's, less, there's less business, he or she, the employer or the organization has not terminated the employees, but instead has put them on a furlough, which um, makes them ineligible to receive um, grants because they have not been quote unquote officially terminated. So some those are some of the things that um, that that we're seeing uh, in uh, in the tourism space that um, you know the um, the governments as well as the organizations themselves are trying to uh, to grapple with that uh, may end up in an arbitration or a dispute management scenario. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sharon. And 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 before I go back to Lucy and Francis and Robert for some final comments. Quickly, Sean, and I know you you like not to get too involved, but in a mediation space, and Francis mentioned that mediation is one of the things that they have been looking at and has worked very well in the context of Asia. What are your, from a Jamaican, broader Caribbean perspective, what are some of your thoughts as to how we have used it and how we could probably use it a little better going forward in, in, the, in this era and even beyond? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a question that can go really, really deep. Um, a lot of us here with, with the experience in, in litigation and arbitration know that um, obviously contested matters um, sometimes can go way off track. Uh, the discussion, um, it, quick response to Robert, I think they're, 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 they're positions on both sides. I mean, if we're talking about democracy, I could argue that also the best democracy is to have the parties themselves determine as much as they can the outcome of their dispute. Um, but yes, there will always be there will always be a place for litigation. Yeah. So I think I tend more to agree with Francis and his position that we need a new model um, that better accommodates the end user, the parties themselves. I know that in my experience, I don't think I can recall any client wanting to read one, two, three hundred page final submissions uh, or the, the judgment at the end of it. What they want to know, especially in a commercial context, is what happened? What's the result for me? What's, you know, and uh, what are we going to do next? Yeah. Um, in the context of Jamaica, Chris, I think especially as we're talking about um, primarily commercial matters. Um, I think we have had, for example, the DRF, the Dispute Resolution Foundation has been there since uh, long before 2002 when I first became an accredited mediator. Um, it, has, it has had opportunities. It's, it's the designated body designated as the, the, um, the, the body that, that civil matters are referred to from the Supreme Court. Um, so in effect, most civil matters are referred to the DRF for an attempt, a, me a mandatory attempt at mediation. Um, I think in the beginning, I would, I would have argued cynically that a lot of the uh, old school lawyers, practitioners would go there and say they had made the attempt and go back to the comfort zone um, go back to the court and have the, the judges, unfortunately, again, be burdened with the task of, of bringing the matter to resolution. 
So I don't think, the short answer is I don't think we've made the best use of, of the facility. I think we could have done a lot more with it. I think there needs to be a lot more promotion, maybe even starting from UE, from the University Law School where it should be mandated that mediation and ADR in general be a compulsory course um, so that we prepare four times like this in the future, um, yeah? So not to take up too much of your time, I think, I think my answer certainly is that we could have done a lot more. We have a lot uh, more to, to do in that regard. The potential is there for, um, for mediation to assist with the backlog that we have. We in Jamaica, um, like many other places, have a backlog. We, we have a challenge with resources, and especially in a time like this with COVID, um, where you're talking about a deluge of disputes. What we need really is a Noah's Ark because there's, there's potentially, as Francis said, in the shadows, there's this tidal wave coming, this tsunami coming. And the court system as it now stands is, even though the mechanism is, is there, the capacity to deal with what's coming, the volume is, is not necessarily there, yeah? So I think mediation could certainly assist with that flow, with, with speeding things up. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my answer, yeah. Okay, thanks, 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 thanks very much, Sean. And time does fly. Eh? In another couple of minutes, we shall hand over to Paula. But before we do, I would like to have some final comments in terms of, I, I, I don't like the word prescription, but in terms of what we think are some viable possibilities for consideration going forward in this arena. Robert, Francis, and Lucy, I'm coming back to you, and perhaps I'll start in the reverse order. Robert, what are some of the thoughts that you have in a few minutes? Just a few of what you think we could and probably should be thinking of doing going forward. Could do. I, I, I think, um, thank you, Chris, that this has been not only informative, but very entertaining, <laughs> at least for me. Um, I, I think what is crystal clear from all of the various perspectives and, and Sean just put a very fine point on it, that our traditional approaches to dispute resolution, especially to the extent that, you know, we used the, you know, big hammer of litigation as a default has to be re-evaluated, revisited, in light of this pandemic, in light of this virtual environment that we have forced found ourselves in. Um, it, 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 to the extent that our new virtual environment um, impacts and affects our ability to gather all in one room uh, physically, it needs to be reevaluated to the extent that we're talking about access to justice as, as a surrogate to the discussion about access to the courts physically and access to trials, it has to be reevaluated to the extent that we're looking at dispute resolution in a virtual environment and we're considering the implications on evidentiary issues, the implications on constitutional issues, the, the implications on uh, due process issues we need to reevaluate to the extent that we're talking about contemplating alternate dispute resolution mechanisms as a part of our interrelationships as a means of managing risk as you like to say allocating losses uh, we do need to take a look at whether or not we can incorporate adr more meaningfully into um, a cost efficient ways of alternate dispute resolution uh, modalities. Um, but I think it was Therese who pointed out to us that there is more to dispute resolution and the intersection between law and society than commercial dispute resolution um, or criminal uh, resolution of criminal matters. She just pointed out that there is dispute resolution that impacts law and society. It impacts questions of constitutionality, uh, questions of constitutionality, which I dare say can't be resolved in an ADR or mediation context because it's the judicial branch that um, plays the role 
of not only interpreting but enforcing laws after unfortunately they've been over politicized by the branch that i will not name but the end of the, at the end of the day you know when those issues arise it is the judges in their role as arbiters in their role as the interpreters and enforcers of the law it is the lawyers in their role as advocates bringing forth these constitutional issues, these issues of overreach by the other branches of government, these issues of the um, enforcement and um, uh, articulation of our individual and collective rights. Those types of disputes also um, have to have their place and also um, need the proper venue to be resolved. And we have to consider that as well, because to the extent that those issues have been delayed or impacted by a pandemic, um, we have to do better. We can't have a scenario where constitutional rights are put on pause, where criminal uh, rights are put on pause, where our day-to-day -day transactional relationships are put on pause because our courts aren't equipped to handle them. So in, in, in my mind, uh, it was Francis who said it, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, in my mind, there are questions, difficult questions that go well beyond just dispute resolution, but that go into resource allocation, resource reallocation, and all of these things that we typically don't think about because they're inconvenient and they're, you know, in the moment, we think not relevant, but that's a short term myopic view that we're obviously now paying for. So um, thank you so much for uh, facilitating this conversation. I wish it could go on for days. Um, and I look forward to being a part, being an, an audience member and watching the other discussions uh, that you will have. Thanks so much. Lucy, the reverse order, any final thoughts before I hand back over to Rose? Are you going to skip Francis? No, well, Francis. <laughs> Sorry, Francis. <laughs> Sorry, Francis. Well, I, I just want to make two quick points. Uh, I think the first uh, is that um, the one issue, Therese, I think you asked, uh, you know, uh, this poignant question about what needs to be done. Many things needs to be done from what you've heard. But the one thing uh, that I want to add to what has been said is that um, we do not have uh, a viable multilateral uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, understanding of how cross-border restructuring and insolvency should properly uh, be implemented across the globe. And uh, for that purpose, I just want to say the CIR, uh, I've uh, worked, I'm working with the Judicial Insolvency Network, uh, this network of judges across the world, um, uh, the significant jurisdictions at least, and the CIR and the Judicial Insolvency Network is currently looking at guidelines, yeah, uh, working on guidelines to be issued to the international community uh, as to what is the optimal uh, structure for this, and uh, in particular, the use of arbitration and ADR in cross-border issues that arise out of cross-border uh, restructuring and insolvency. This is one issue that we are going to come head on with uh, post-pandemic, um, uh, you know, we are already, uh, you know, the, the problems are already boiling, uh, but that's one thing that we need to fix at a multilateral level, apart from the many, many issues that we have at the multilateral level. The only last thing I want to say, uh, Chris, we've had a scintillating uh, conversation, uh, mainly because you have directed traffic very well today. Thank you. Over to you, Chris. Yes, I'm Lucy. <laughs> I'm not properly at Lu you, Lucy. I will be quick. I think whenever something is overwhelming uh, and we didn't, uh, it's, this is overwhelming to all of us, COVID-19 in different ways. It's important to step back and say, what do I know how to do? What steps can I take in, in my life? And what I've heard today is endorsement of the idea, this is for the, the lawyers, that we can at every opportunity urge more mediation of issues. We can we can urge legislators or courts or both, depending on the jurisdiction, to impose mandatory mediation of 
COVID-19 related disputes and we can urge bar associations, whether they're national or local or international to um, develop programs for voluntary mediators to serve uh, with really with just expenses being paid. It's the little things that, that can add up instead of you know, just throwing up our hands, it's impossible. We'll never get back to the old world. And, and think of, as I say, think of what we know how to do uh, in our different uh, skills and, and professions instead of, <laughs> instead of giving up. So I'll remember Teresa's words. Thank you for, for including me. I wish I, were, uh, I wish I were there in person. I will be again. Thanks, thank, thanks much, Lucy. And I, I'll leave Paula to do the official vote of thanks at the end, except, but I must complete by saying it has really been my pleasure and great privilege to have moderated the session with persons who are as preeminent as you are. And, and I certainly have learned a lot. And I trust that others of us who have been watching as well have learned equally, if not more than I have learned, as much, if not more. And I hand over now to Rose, who will then do a bit of formalities in turning over to Paula as well. Thank you so much, um, Malcolm. You know, and if we were in, a, in Jamaica right now, I would say a round of applause for our distinguished panelists. And um, I have learned so much from all of you. And I have to say there is one little caveat, and I, probably Malcolm will have to do a redo, for just investor state disputes. And, um, and Lucy said something very, very important. And all of, all of you, we can agree with one thing is that I think COVID-19 has forced, have brought us to our knees to become more human, to actually think about humanity. And, um, and talking about those kind of claims and how we want to resolve them made me think about my years when I was in Ghana, when I look especially at the um, uh, whether or not uh, class action arbitration could be used as a means to resolve the disputes for the indigenous people, because there are so many. One person alone would not have a viable claims, but a whole village would have. And now we have an entire pandemic. However, my questions, and I'm not opening this again, and Malcolm will have to think about it, maybe some specialty for investor state disputes. I do not foresee those investors who have billions in the investment and due to the government's acting in fear, making regulations, if they are going under an old BIT, um, would actually agree to come to the model of some kind of funds to to get them something. I, I, don't, I just don't see it. And uh, maybe Lucy, you would think about that for the future. And um, because this is, this is the area I focus on. And I think um, everything you said, I, I couldn't agree more, but those investors who are pouring billions in Africa, for instance, and for that matter, sometimes in the Caribbean, how are we going to address their needs? Would the, would the mediation, would the, or maybe they, they would love Robert's way in terms of litigation. That's, that's what they would, they would spend money on that. So I think what Lucy says also counts. We will always have some of the cases that would go this route. But really, really, it was extremely insightful and I really enjoy it. And I'm sure many, I see a lot of questions coming in. Some people were even asking me questions. I said, no, ask Malcolm. So it's been wonderful. Now, um, I am going, it's not over yet. The best is yet to come. <laughs> I am going to introduce uh, Miss Paula Herlock, who's going to give us um, the vote of thanks. She is a development specialist with over 25 years experience in the field. She was part of the first cohort uh, trained in street law in Jamaica. She brings to the table her ability to implement initiatives that do not yet exist. In her most recent position as global manager of social impact initiatives at Sutherland Global, Paula developed and, and implemented Sutherland Jamaica's social impact program through positive interaction with the wider community and strong partnership forged 
with government and non-government entities alike. She has received the 2019 Microsoft Excellence Award for Impact Resourcing Leadership and IAOP Rockefeller 2020 Global Impact um, Sourcing Award. Please welcome uh, Ms. Paula Herlock for her vote of thanks. And if you want to hear, uh, read any more about her bio, please look at our website for a more extensive um, role of what she's done. Thank you. Paula, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Rose. And uh, thank you so much to everyone else here. Ladies and gentlemen, an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheel started rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and an eye for details. We have been very fortunate to have a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues. And I would like to take the opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to the chief organizer and his team at the JIAC, Dr. Christopher Malcolm, visionary behind the series. So round of applause. Um, big thank you also to Nordia and team for the excellent logistics support and guidance required to make this event possible. So on behalf of the team at the Jamaica International Arbitration Council, I would like to thank all of the speakers and participants from all over the world. I see people in the chat room saying, listen, it's 1245, I have to sign off, no, I have to go to bed. So we really just wanna you know, let you know how grateful we are, both you know, people all over the world who have you know, deprive themselves of sleep to be here. Thank you so much. And we would also especially um, like to acknowledge the, the presence of our Chief Justice, Zelia McCalla, who was part of, you know, uh, the, the audience. So thank you also for joining and staying for the whole thing. And a big thank you to Rose. Rose, thank you for moderating today's opening remarks. To Sean Henriquez for his warm welcome and Therese, Turner Jones for bringing opening remarks from the IDB on the regional economic implications of the pandemic. Further, we are grateful to Sharon Flatsbrutus for bringing an overview of the tourism space and the conflicts and disputes that have resulted as a result of the pandemic. I must mention our deep, sense, deep sense of appreciation to our esteemed panel. The truth is, we have some of the busiest people on this planet right here on this panel. Please know that we are grateful to you for taking time out to be part of the very relevant discussions related to the COVID-19 pandemic and its dispute resolution implications. Sincere thank you, first of all, to Francis who got up early, <laughs> filled with energy for laying the foundation for the unprecedented global implications of the pandemic and the need for low cost and quick solutions, which are fair and mediatory rather than confrontational. Sincere thanks to Lucy Reed for giving an excellent coverage and analysis on what is to come. The truth is we, we really don't know what is to come, but thank you Lucy for laying it out um, you know, mediation and conciliation and how necessary it is for government to be involved and innovative ways of making claim, given all the changes involved, you know, as a result of, of the pandemic. We'd also like to acknowledge Robert Vaughn for jumping in because of his DNA <laughs> on several of the issues that were, you know, being discussed, uh, for exposing issues related to business interruption and the appropriate models which would now need to be adopted um, <coughs> associated claims as well as you know employer and employee issues coming out of the pandemic. Such a rich discussion. We thank you panelists. We thank you, we thank you. Um, I think it was a beautiful mix um, of panelists, uh, panelists, such a lot to think about. We were all very inspired by, by your perspectives and thank you so much for sharing them. Now, lastly, I would like to extend a special thanks to our media sponsor, um, Hype TV, Johan Dawes from Hype TV. Uh, they're behind um, the wonderful jam session that you are now about to witness. So I'm cutting short my vote of thanks um, to you know, invite everyone here. I have been sipping coffee 
from my GIC <laughs> bog all afternoon. And I'm very talented in my ability to switch from coffee to rum. So now that we're at the end of the event, we can now switch to rum. And uh, one of our sponsors, Money Musk Rum, I have them here as well. So I'm switching from coffee to rum. And rum, of course, goes with reggae. And we have Jamaican songbird, Karen Smith, who is going to be doing the post reasoning jam session. And she's gonna be bringing the reggae vibes to this webinar. So in closing, thanks again to everyone. And it's not over. We're going to do, this is the part where we all get together and let our hair down. Now we're going to be showing, sharing screen uh, through Zoom. But in addition to that, if you would like a more high definition experience, we're going to be placing in the chat, the link to the YouTube version of this uh, live musical special with um, Karen Smith. So um, a round of applause. Can we do a round of applause of virtually? I think we can. Greetings, everybody from beautiful Kingston, Jamaica. We're so happy to be with you. Welcome, welcome. Your 
guitar And I, I won't forget Your, I said your, your child Happy to be with you, happy to be with you. Welcome to Jamaica, in a manner of speaking. You know, you have to use imagination and everything. So after that wonderful webinar, we learned so much, so many views put forward, we learned so much. We're happy to give you a little musical treat from Jamaica. So here are some songs that helped to put our music on the map from way back in the day. And I see you dancing, you know, if you're at home, if you're at the office, it's time to have a little fun. Relax, let your hair down, relax, that's what it's all about. So, reggae music from way back in the day, from Jamaica. <laughs> Get up in the morning, slaving for bread, sir. So that every mouth can be fed Poor Israelites hey! Get up in the morning slaving for bread, sir So that every mouth can be fed Poor Israelites my wife and my kids pack up and I lay me. Darling, she said I was yours to receive. Oh, 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 oh. me is a light. Me shut them my tear up choices ago. I don't want to end up like Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, 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 oh. me is a light. I said that I'm up the rest of them, there must be a calm. If they catch me in a farm, you sound your alarm. Oh, 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 oh me is a light. The Melodians, that was music from Desmond Deco, and now this is the Melodians. Woo! We love this one. Babylon, where we sat down, and there we wait when we remember Zion. One more time, because we like it. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Shine. Shine. I'm gonna get Shine. my shit 
McDonald today, who is uh, playing and singing and has brought reggae music to the four corners of the earth. And I'm privileged to have you here with me, Chris. So Thank you nice, very much. so nice being here. So nice being here. What are we doing now, sweet boy? Back to the chair. <laughs> Every day can't be the same day. Some days are better than some. Oh, that's life. Well, that's what people say. You're flying high in April, not down in May. But I know I'm gonna change that too. When I'm back on top in June. Oh, that's life. Funny as it seems. Some people get the kicks stepping on. This whole world keeps going around. I've been a puppet, a papa, a pirate, a poet, a pawn, and a king. I've been up and down and over and out, and I know one thing. Each time I find myself flat on my face, I pick myself up and I get back in the race. Cause that's life.
Every day can't be the same day. Every day can't be the same day. And we're so happy to have you with us in Jamaica today in a manner of speaking. Imagination. Yes, beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yeah, the beach and palm trees and the breeze. And we have to remember our sponsors. So we want to thank our sponsors for their involvement in being able to bring you this wonderful event from Jamaica today. So it's Money Musk. Money Musk Rum, Jamaica International Arbitration Center. Our main sponsors, of course, more than a sponsor. This is your brainchild, Christopher Malcolm. And I see you over there, you know. Chris is here in the studio, you know, but he's shy. He want to show his beautiful face on camera. We don't know why. And uh, Island Blue Coffee. Island Blue Coffee. So thank you very much for your involvement. And we know this is the beginning, and we're looking forward to so much more. There's so much more to learn. And this, in the brand new world in which we live, information is going to be so well, it is right now. It's, it's important. Information is so important. So you really can't have enough to make informed decision. Oh, too much talking. Not here for that. Let's keep going. <laughs> oh. This is music from uh, another time for the Olympic effort. Thank you, Peter Ashbourne and Alvin Campbell for this wonderful song. The winds of hope are blowing into tomorrow's dawn the march of time is keeping step we're moving on we open up our arms and face the future and we believe we've got the will to win well the time has come it's the day we've worked for so many years nation is waiting and hoping we will take the cheers oh we planned and we worked now we're ready now the way ahead seems oh so clear this is the time now is the test this is the place the very best Yes, this is the road Now we're just a step away Today We're striving for gold Oh well Smiling faces and hands Have helped us along the way the road has been hard and the turns have sometimes led us astray But the memories have been sweet and we have made it Oh, we are ready now to face it come what may Oh, this is the time This is the time Now is the test Now is the test This is the place you're the best of the very best Yes, this is the road Now we're just a step away Today We're striving for gold This is the time This is the time Now is the test Now is the test This is the place This is the place
sing it very nicely to notice. certainly having a good time being with you. So nice of you to join us. So nice of you to join us here in lovely Kingston, Jamaica. <laughs> this is dedicated. Same one, same one. To the one I love. Each night before you go to bed.
Put your hands together, y'all. Come on. Come on. Come on. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. I said, when it's cold outside, I've got the mud for me. I saw going on there. That was great. So we are coming to you from the historic Harry J Studios in Kingston, Jamaica, where Bob Marley and the Whalers recorded their seminal, world-breaking <laughs> albums, introducing reggae to the world, introducing reggae to the world. And we are so grateful for the legacy of Bob Marley. There is only one. There will never be another one. So we're going back in time. We know you know these songs. If you've been sitting down and not getting involved, now is the time. Get up, up off the couch, get close up. the door, get up, get up from behind the desk. Time to just 
Relax and enjoy yourself. And what did I say? Let you right, let it down, let it down, let it down. Relax. Here we go. <laughs> Talking 
Jamaica, you know when everything cooled down and calmed down and you can come and see us, we're looking forward to seeing you. To relax and spend some time and get to know us and perhaps even visit the historic Harry J Studios here in Kingston, Jamaica. We're not sure. But well, we're looking forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for joining us and see you soon again when you come to Jamaica and come visit. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, our event, Dispute Management in a New World, would not have been possible without our organizers and our sponsors. And we must take a moment to thank everyone. So we would like to thank the organizers, the Jamaica International Arbitration Center, J-A-I-A-C, and our sponsors, Jamaica Standard Products, Island Blue Jamaica Mountain Coffee, Money Musk Gold Rum, Caribbean Producers Jamaica Limited, Virgin Gorda Villa Rentals, Luxury Holiday Villas, Burroughs and Wallace, Charles O'Connor Consulting Network Limited, Virtus Technology, Trial Media Litigation Support Services, Native Answer, and our media partner, Hype TV, Johan and the team, we want to thank you. Local, regional, and international supporting institutions. This is webinar number one. So many more to go. Thank you all for having joined us and hope you had a wonderful time. I certainly enjoyed Karen Smith and her performance. This is what we are all miss. Those of you who have never seen Karen live, believe me, it's an amazing experience to have Karen live when she's up close and personal. And we expect that when we get back to live in Jamaica, we will all have an opportunity to have Karen with us. Paula, what were you about to say as you close out? Well, I, I thought I needed to sit because everybody else was sitting. But if I, you know, I, only Rose and I were brave enough to get up and dance. <laughs> <laughs> but Robert, we saw you. We saw you. And Celia, we saw you. We saw you. So, you know, glad you guys stayed to the end. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event.